What's happening, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Crash Bang Boom podcast. Today's guest is drummer Ed Toth, who formerly played with Vertical Horizon and presently plays with the Doobie Brothers, who are embarking on their 50th anniversary tour with the one and only Michael McDonald, who starts later this August. Ed and I get into some of the history of the Doobie Brothers, his musical childhood, the late 90s scene with Vertical Horizon and fellow bands, as well as catching the police and journey live in the 80s. So hope y'all dig the hang. Crash Bang Boom Podcast can be found on iTunes Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Luminary, Google Play, Podbean, and Amazon Music Podcasts, as well as many others. Feel free to check out any of the previous 200 plus episodes. Give me a like, a subscription, and or a positive review as the support is appreciated. Shout out to my sponsor, New Orleans Record Press. If you're looking to release some vinyl, hit them up at neworleansrecordpress.com to check out all the electroplating, mastering, design, packaging, vinyl coloring options, and they got a real-time quote generator to keep tabs and all that. They also print 12 and 7-inch records in 150 and 180 gram variants, and they do small runs of 100 and larger runs up into the thousands. So hit them up, and that's neworleansrecordpress.com. All right, here we go. Without further ado, Ed Toth, Crash Bang Boom. Go mad with joy. All right, I'm here with Ed Toth of the Doobie Brothers. Ed, thanks for catching up, man. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. It's it's 10 o'clock in the morning out here in sunny California. I know, man. Where are you based out of California? Or and I know you're out there obviously rehearsing for this string of 50th anniversary shows with the Doobie Brothers, but where are you generally based out of? Yeah, well, we, yeah, we're definitely out here rehearsing. Um, I live now in eastern Pennsylvania. I spent the last 15 years in Nashville, and like a lot of people during COVID, I reassessed some things in my life and decided uh, that the long-distance relationship I was in needed to be a short-distance relationship. So, yeah. And she's from eastern Pennsylvania, so I moved there. Nice. So if you're eastern, are you kind of out near, like, Philly? Yeah, pretty much near Philly. I, I live in Lancaster, like Amish country. Gotcha. Gotcha. So is it pretty, it's pretty rural out there where you are? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, I take a left out of my driveway and I'm driving through farmland. I take a right out of my driveway and I'm in a sort of, you know, hip, modern, urban city. <laughs> <laughs> little, a little bit of everything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, man, I, congrats on, on doing this tour. I was just looking at the dates. It looks like it kicks up here in August and then takes you through September and a little bit into October and then kicks back up in June of 2022. So no shortage of shows. You got Michael McDonald in the house. Obviously, it'd be great talking to you about working with him. And yeah, man, I mean, my God, 50 years, uh, no shortage of material. So I guess when it comes to getting a set list that uh, that comprises of 50 years worth of material, do they just send you 50 songs and say, learn all these and we sub them out? Or is the set list pretty solid once y'all get going? Yeah, I mean, you, right where we're at right now is I, I think we, we pretty much played and learned all the songs that we're going to play. Now it's up to, you know, the the, the head guys will, will get together and put a set list together. And, you know, I'm a big proponent of crafting a show um i always believe that the show begins for people when they walk into the arena like what kind of music is playing over the pa mm -hmm. you know right until the the point that people are walking out of the arena you know, yeah and everything in between so it's it's a little bit of a weird spot being a side guy like you know you, you have a say in some things and 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 you sort of keep your nose out of other things but um yeah, I, I, Pat Simmons in particular likes to sort of involve me in the in the set list because he knows that I think of it in terms of a really a storytelling arc. Like mm -hmm. you know, you, you have a couple of hours to tell a story, so what's that going to look like? You know, absolutely. Well, when did these rehearsals start, and I guess how long? What is the duration of of the rehearsals for getting all this material together? Well, our, our rehearsal schedule is generally, we I flew out here in mid-July, had a couple of days to do some tech stuff with my kit, because uh, I hadn't seen it in this particular kit in over a year, mm. and I'm happy to say it held up. I'll tell you, man, it's a, it's a DW Purple Heart kit, and man, I think I turned two lugs on the whole kit. It's a it's a five-com kit. Wow. <laughs> I, think I, I think I turned two lugs. The, the drums stayed in tune 
sitting in a box in a storage facility for a year and a half. You wow. Know? So that was really cool, a testament to that to their product. Yeah. But yeah, we generally we generally go in around noon and um we we generally work till about six, six thirty at night. And basically it's just sort of uh, okay, what do we need to do? You know, and whoever's song we're playing, if it's Tom Johnson's song, Pat Simmons song, Michael McDonald's song, the that person is generally sort of the captain of that of that moment in rehearsal. Uh-huh. And a, a lot of repetition, man. It's really just a lot of repetition, sort of playing the songs over and over and over again. Like some of them, obviously, like China Grove, listen to the music. We don't really have to spend a lot of time on those. Right. But because we're headlining on this tour, you know, we're going to be playing for two, two and a half hours as opposed to the hour and a half that we have been doing. So you need to add that many more songs. Plus with the Michael song, we the only Michael song we play when Michael's not with us is taking it to the streets. Right. So there's there's another half dozen or so songs that are Michael McDonald's Doobie Brothers songs. Totally. That we had to, you know, and we want them to sound as tight as possible. Yeah. So, like I said, a lot of repetition. <laughs> oh, absolutely, man. And how many people are on the stage at this point? How many members of, are up on the stage for this for this tour? I think it's nine. So wow. it's, it's it's the lineup that we've had over the last few years, which is. You know, the main doobie guys, Tom Johnson, Pat Simmons, and John McPhee. Mm. Uh, we've got John Cowan playing bass. Um, Mark Quinones is playing percussion. Uh, Mark Russo is playing sax. And Billy Payne from Little Feet plays keys. Nice. Um, and now we've added Michael. To, now we've added Michael to that mix as well. Right. So it's a good handful of people. <laughs> Absolutely. It's funny, man, you mentioned uh, playing with a percussionist. In my experience, it kind of levels out your playing uh, because you need to leave that additional space for where maybe you would be playing maybe a little more ghost notes or maybe a little bit more in the subdivision ghost note realm. The percussion can often fill in some of those spots, so you kind of uh, have to level your playing out and make it a little spacious, I've found. Has that been sort of your experience with it as well? A little bit, yeah. I mean, there's percussion all over the Doobie Brothers tracks, and I played along with these records as a kid. Right. Um, you know, so I'm kind of familiar where the where the, the drums sit in there. It's a, it's a bit easier to manage now. You know, the Doobies for a very long time was two drummers. Right. Um, <laughs> so when I fir- when I first joined the band in '05, all the way up to 2016, I was always playing with another drummer. Wow. Um, and that certainly helped you, like lay back and just kind of do your thing and mm-hmm. we would sort of orchestrate like you know you do that fill i'll do this fill uh we can alternate fills here we'll play this fill in unison like that kind of stuff so we right. would just talk through that stuff and so it wasn't too bad but now with a percussionist it, it really it, it adds a, a flavor to the music that i think is really important uh for doobie brothers music because like i said there's percussion on almost every doobie brother track that was recorded right whether it's congos or tambourine or you know there's something in there that gives it that lift right um so it was a little bit of adjustment when mark came in but not too much and i you know when they decided that maybe they were thinking about hiring a percussionist i immediately suggested mark Mm. um because i knew from you know doing gigs with with greg allman and and the allman brothers and that I knew that Mark really knew where to where to sit in terms of being a rock and roll percussionist. He wasn't just going to be a guy that went up there and tried to fill up as much space as he could, right. you know. And the other great thing about Mark is he's a percussionist. I mean, he's not like a drum set player who was looking for a gig and said, "Oh yeah, I'll play percussion on your tour." Right. Like he's a legit, you know, he's a salsa guy. Yeah, yeah. And that's 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 another thing I. I liked about mark so when he came in we did a few rehearsals and we did a gig to sort of see how it would go and he's been there ever since damn wow man and uh how many songs are uh, about in the set right now uh for what y'all are looking to go do these next couple of months uh, that's a good question man i think it's probably almost 30 tunes that's what i figured yeah yeah somewhere between uh like 27 and 30 tunes and um I don't think we're going to add any more. I think we've got what we need time-wise, and uh, it's a good mix of songs, man. It's, 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 of course, all the songs that people want to hear are, are in there, and then we've got a good mix of uh, some album tracks that we have been playing over the years that people seem to like and that we enjoy playing, mm-hmm. and then there's a good handful of stuff that is new to us, particularly the Michael songs, of course, Right. and um, 
the Doobies have, we, you know, we've dusted off a couple of tunes that they haven't played since the mid seventies. And, um, they've got some new stuff out now as well. So we'll be playing a couple of those songs. Right. Man, it's funny you mentioned uh, the Keys player who's f formerly with Little Feet. I talk about Little Feet occasionally, and it seemed like such a regional thing. I mean, my mother, for instance, had albums, uh, some Little Feet albums in her record collection, so I grew up kind of sorting through her records and seeing those records. But it's funny, outside of the South, where I grew up, it, didn't see, it doesn't seem like many people were all that familiar with Little Feet, and I'm assuming it's because of some of their tracks got sort of lumped in with that Southern rock style so maybe alongside like Skinner and and uh, the Marshall Tucker band or even like some Atlantic rhythm section or uh, it's, I think Little Feet kind of got lumped in with that so it, again it seemed as though regionally like in the south more people were familiar with them despite them being a band from California uh, have you noticed that by any chance yeah man I think Little Feet got lost in the shuffle a little bit I mean whoever the people are that decide you know who's hip and who's not hip I mean Little Feet didn't get a lot of press when they were around and right. they were almost sort of a, a cult thing like if, if you knew you knew and it's kind of like that now you know it's yeah like talk about Little Feet it's like man if you know you know um, right and I, you know musicians love them you, you talk to any musician that's worth their salt and and they're pretty much Little Feet fans right so yeah I'm not quite sure why they sort of flown under the radar um, all these years but they're still out there doing it and um you know, to all the drummers listening to this, if you have not checked out Richie Hayward with Little Feet, you're you're missing something special. Yeah, man. It's funny, too. You mentioned your percussionists having associations with uh, with the Allman Brothers. If we're talking about Southern Rock, hard to not mention them in that breath as well, even though they were always kind of the jazzy experimental side of it. But undeniably, Southern Rock as well, man. Oh, my God, I love the Allman Brothers. Woo! Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> With uh, you playing with them for uh, for the Doobies for 16 years or so, it sounds like, I guess, how did you get the gig to begin with? So uh, back to 2005. So I was sort of wrapping up things with Vertical Horizon. We were, I was in a band Vertical Horizon for 10 years. Yeah. And we had had a couple of hits and, and had done fairly well, but we were starting to, I think looking back now, I always used to think that we sort of imploded, but that really wasn't the case. I think looking back, we were a little burnt out. You know, we had done a lot of time on the road and uh, released a record, a major label record that had done very well. We released a follow-up to that record, which we thought was better, um, like a step up, and it just didn't get any attention from the record label at all. The, the record label had changed hands mm -hmm. while we were making that record. So the team we had in place that uh, was really heavily into promoting what was the everything you want record was gone. And right. so, you know, we didn't, we didn't know the new people. They weren't getting behind us. The label president was taking the label in a different direction. So, you know, we went out and toured it and it just didn't get the traction at radio that we hoped it would and all that other stuff. So, but we had done all this touring um, practically sort of nonstop except to make the record. And, um, uh, you know, I was sort of debating whether or not I was going to stay. And right about this time, a longtime doobie drummer, uh, Keith Knudsen, passed away. Mm. And um, what happened was I got a call a few months later from Michael Hossack, who was the other drummer, uh, who was a friend of mine. Mm. And he said, you know, we're going to audition people with, you know, and he knew my situation was vertical because we were friends, you know. Yeah. And uh, he said, you want to come? play you know we're inviting like a handful of guys to play and we'll pick a guy and i said yeah i'll i'll, I'll go play that I'll, I'll come down and audition that'll be great you know right um how i knew how i knew michael hosack was he was a vertical horizon fan mm. so i got i got to meet him once in san francisco at the warfield theater and i just told him i said man i you know i learned how to play my instrument playing along the record that you made it's really an honor to meet you and and so that struck up a friendship between me and him. This would have been in like 2002, I think. Right. So I'd known Mike, I'd known Michael Hossack for a good three years. And uh, after Keith passed, they decided to keep doing the two drummer thing. And, and they auditioned. Uh, I can't remember if it was six of us or eight of us. And I, I thought nothing of it. I thought there's no way I'm getting this gig. These guys are 20 years older than me. Right. Um, there were some main guys on the audition, uh, some guys that they knew that they were friends with for free 
you know, decades. And I just thought, you know what, this will be cool. I'll, I'll go to California. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be in the Doobie Brothers for a half an hour <laughs> and get to play those songs with those guys because I'd played them for years in bar bands, you know, right. Tiny Grove and listen to the music and Long Train Running. Totally. And, uh, yeah, 16 years later, here we are talking about the Doobie Brothers. Oh, my God, man. What a trip. It's funny hearing you talking about growing up playing uh, the Doobie Brothers songs because – it's interesting in that, you know, if I was going to amass my like top 15 70s rock songs and honestly like tracks from the 80s, the Doobie Brothers, once they got Michael McDonald in there, I would say that the latter with the 80s, I could certainly include some Doobie Brothers songs in some of my favorite 80s songs. And then if I'm talking about 70s rock, uh, undeniably uh, the same thing there as well with that early Doobie Brothers stuff, sort of pre-Michael McDonald. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Is it uh, tr is it not trippy? Like playing what a fool believes, for instance, on stage, and then looking over, and you're like, "Holy shit, Michael McDonald is singing this thing." <laughs> yeah, it's weird. You know, I was I was I was talking to one of the new crew guys just last night, and I said, "Yeah, it 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 has those moments for sure." You know, on one hand, it's just like, okay, you know, I've worked really hard as a musician, and I've sort of climbed my own personal company ladder. You know, why wouldn't I be in a band like this? You know, right. And then on the other, and then on the other hand, you know, uh, I'm a I'm a guy who wrote a fan letter to the Doobie Brothers fan club when I was 11 years old. Wow. So, so sometimes I have those pinch me moments of like, wow, this is really happening. I mean, just the other day we were we were milling about before rehearsal, and and McDonald came up to me and he goes, man, I got to tell you, man, Vertical Horizon was a great band. He like sang the chorus of everything you want to me and just come like, on wow cool <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's like i'm like michael mike michael mcdonald knows of, of vertical horizon that's fantastic unbelievable man and he, you know michael's an interesting case as well because uh sort of similar to hall of notes he's one of those rare guys that maybe operated more so in the rock world but crossed over to r&b charts you know uh similar to like i said like what hall and oates did and not many artists were really able to do that i mean i kind of just named the two that 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 came to mind but uh is it it must be cool i guess having these additional songs in the set now that he contributed to and that kind of rounding out the set as well that's got to be cool right it really is you know i've told people i said you know imagine that you're playing in Van Halen and you're doing a show with David Lee Roth and with Sammy Hagar. Right. <laughs> totally. I thought about that. You're, and you're playing all that material. Um, yeah. You know, or you're doing a Genesis show with Peter and with Phil. Yeah. And you get to play all that material. Right. So, I mean, that's, uh, you know, the doobies to me, you know, they were, they were one of those, you know, they pulled off the lead singer switch way before Van Halen did. Right. Um, you, you know, and it just became, you know, the band just evolved a little bit. It just became a different kind of band, and there's nothing wrong with that. And so some people, are, like Van Halen fans, some people are like, oh, it's the, it's Tom Johnston or nothing. And other people are like, no, it's Michael McDonald or nothing. Right. And then you got all these people that are going to come see us this year that are like, I'll take it all, man. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's where I sit with it. It's I, I'll take all of it. I mean, you've got total guitar, 70s guitar rock anthems, uh, with Tom Johnston, and then you've got these incredibly awesome sort of R and B ish style pop hits with Michael, right? And it's wonderful. Absolutely, it's interesting the way that it sounds like you were kind of brought in uh, as a dual drummer, and then now after all these years, you're in it. It sounds kind of a little bit similar to the way that, to my understanding, that Michael McDonald ended up in this in the. Uh, Doobie Brothers in that he came in once the one of the primary singer songwriters was sick and he came in uh, via a connection from I think even having worked with Steely Dan previously and then the next thing you know he becomes a full time member, which is kind of crazy. He came in totally on the recommendation of uh, Skunk Baxter, right? Um, who he had who he he had toured with Michael with Steely Dan, and uh, he said, "Look, I I know this guy is a fantastic piano player and he's a really great singer." You know, maybe we could bring him in to, to sort of fill out some stuff. They weren't touring with a keyboard player at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he could help fill in some of the vocal stuff, too. And that's exactly what happened. And then as as it turns out, the guy happens to be a really good songwriter as well. Oh, my God. So. Completely. With a one-of-a-kind, unmistakable voice to boot. For sure. Absolutely, man. 
You know, it's uh, funny. I, I'm a total 70s rock nerd, and um, it's one of my – and when I was thinking about some of my favorite 70s rock songs, like I was mentioning earlier, uh, I, I was like, you know what? I'll whittle it down to themes. I like themes. Like, so if I go with – if Highway is in the name, then I can go with, like, Highway Star from Deep Purple. I go to Headed Out to the Highway from Judas Priest, and I can go Rocking Down the Highway from the Doobie Brothers, and that has both rock and highway in it. So I'm killing two birds with one stone, you know? Like, all the other ones would be uh, – would have rock in the name of them uh as well which is hilarious <laughs> but uh what are some of the other uh 70s rock uh bands that you dug it sounds like the doobie brothers was certainly one of them well i'll tell you before i answer that question i you know we haven't even talked about pat simmons like you add pat stuff into the mix like black water and all that finger picking stuff he does oh absolutely so it's all of a sudden like what kind of band am i in am i in a r&b pop band am i in a uh, uh, picking, you know, bluegrass influenced right. rock band. Am I in a guitar driven seventies band? It's like I'm in. Uh, it's it's all of that, which right. is just absolutely wonderful. That's awesome. Um, and the seventies, the seventies stuff that I was really into was really what my father had in his record collection, which at the time would have been, you know, he was really into the California thing. So you know, uh, the first couple of Fleetwood Mac records when Lindsay and Stevie joined. Yeah. Uh, the self-titled one, and of course, Rumors as well. Absolutely. Um, a lot of R&B stuff in my dad's 70s record collection. Stevie Wonder, uh, Rufus with Shaka Khan. Sure. Tower of Power. Oh, yeah. Uh, was a big deal for me in the 70s. Um, and, you know, he had Eagles records and, and stuff like that as well. So we were kind of all over the map with, with music. Mm -hmm. um, but those are the groups that stand out for me in the 70s. I mean, I, I you know, I... When I got older, I got into progressive rock, so bands like Rush and Genesis and Yes. Sure. Um, in particular, those bands I, I enjoy listening to. Oh, yeah. And there's just, you know, there's just an infinite, I mean, it's called classic rock for a reason. Right. I mean, there's an infinite amount of amazingly great material. You know, I still, when More Than a Feeling by Boston comes on the radio, like, I can't turn the station. I need to turn it up. <laughs> totally. It's still such a great song. One of the great voices in rock and roll, Brad Delp, who doesn't get talked about enough. Totally. And it's just a great song. So there's a, we could talk for days about, you know, great songs of the 70s. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. It's fun talking to you about it because I'm kind of a bit of an outlier with most of my friends. I feel like uh, they dabble in it a little bit. And I mean, I've got 500 records and I'd say easily two thirds are from like, you know, 67 to like 78 with the majority of them being from 70 to 76, <laughs> I would say. Right. I just love that stuff. But it's funny you mentioned Tower of Power, man. One of my all-time favorite sound and records that I have is actually the first one they put out in 70, East Bay Grease. Great record. Man, that record, like on vinyl, to hear the bass, uh, David Garibaldi's drumming on it, the, the horns, everything about it. It's such a powerful, live, killer sound and record. My God. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, there's a sort of excessive amount of reverb in that mix as well, which in a way makes it really kind of cool and, yeah, you know, adds that, it, it, it dates it a little bit, but like in a cool way, not yeah. in, a, in a bad way. So yeah, that's kind of interesting. That's a, that's a great record. Absolutely, man. Uh, well, it sounds like uh, just from hearing you list some of the bands that you were listening to, uh, we were, were into a lot of the same stuff, but uh, what about sort of growing up and seeing any particular shows that blew your mind? That could, and that could be from you know any particular era. I'm not sure how old you are. I'm 45, so I was uh, probably wasn't going to see shows until the mid 80s for me. But yeah, I'm in my early 50s, so I started seeing shows in the 70s because my parents were. I just had hip parents. I mean, the first concert my father ever took me to was in 1974, and it was Tower of Power. Oh, amazing. First concert I ever saw in my life. And oh I, my I mean, God. I was five years old, so I don't remember a lot of it, but I do remember bits and pieces of it. I, I definitely remember the experience of it, which was just really something. Whoa. And then after that, you know, every year, in it always seemed to be in August that the Doobie Brothers were in Connecticut, which is where I grew up. So I think I was eight years old the first time I went to see the Doobies, 1977. Huh. And um, saw him a, saw him a few times, you know, back in the day. It was always it was always with Michael. I never saw him with Tom Johnston until uh. Uh, later when they reunited in the late '80s. I got I got to see them uh, with Tom Johnston. But wow. um, yeah, so Doobie Brothers shows, and then in high school in the '80s, man. I mean, you named the band, and I saw them. 
I saw the police. I saw In Excess. I saw Journey. I saw Rush a million times. Amazing. I'm also a Pat Metheny freak, so I've been going to Pat Metheny shows since I was 10 years old. Wow. Yeah, so, I mean, just just and just last night I went to Catalina Jazz Club here in Los Angeles and watched Jeff Hamilton play, who was fantastic. I'm all over the map. Yeah, I mean, I am, I am too. It's good to hear uh, that you're still excited to go see shows, and it started early for you, especially if your first show was – was Tower of Power. That's unbelievable, especially in the era that you saw them. And then it sounds like when you saw the Doobie Brothers, if you saw them in the late 70s, uh, that was that was right around the time when uh, they had just put out the, one of their bigger records as well. So you saw them at a, at a pretty amazing point in their career as well, I feel like. Well, absolutely. And then just some bands that you can't see anymore, like seeing the police in the 80s. Totally. I mean, I saw the re I saw the reunion tour in 07, but it it was nothing compared to like what it was in the 80s. But I was also 14 and like way into Stuart Copeland. Hell yeah, you were. <laughs> so my perspective was a little different on stuff. Yeah. And uh, you know, the last time I saw Rush, uh, which was on their last tour, was different than the first time I saw Rush, which was in 1983. Yeah. So you know. It's it's all perspective and where you are at any given time. But, I mean, yeah, man, I get to see Journey with Steve Perry, man. Come on. That's unbelievable. My God. Wow. Yeah. Uh, did you Do you know what record you saw the police on the first time that you saw them? Because I, too, as are most drummers, a massive fan of Stuart Copeland. That's killer that you saw him. Yeah, it was their last tour. It was a synchronicity tour. Ah, oh, amazing. Yeah, I saw it in Providence, Rhode Island. Wow. Oh, man. God, I would have loved to have seen that. <laughs> still got my ticket stub too oh, I bet you do I still got all my ticket stubs from my childhood as well man I gotta laminate them or do something with them at some point They're, they've they've traveled with me all these years in a Ziploc bag and I've got some of them laminated but it's always trippy to like sort back through them and just see them all and be reminded of all these awesome shows and honestly still to this day when I buy a uh, co concert ticket I prefer to pay a little extra to have them send me the physical one so I can just add it to the collection <laughs> you know oh absolutely yeah, I, was, I just bought tickets for this upcoming Genesis tour. Awesome. And uh, I, uh, you know, they were going to hold my tickets at Will Call. They wanted me to send them to my phone or something. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, <laughs> you know, yeah. I need a hard copy ticket <laughs> here to put in my, my ticket album, you know? Totally. Oh, that's funny, man. You know, it's funny you mentioned Van Halen earlier, and I was doing some research and actually stumbled upon this really interesting fact, and I'm assuming it connects back to the producer Ted Templeman, who obviously worked on all so much of what the Doobie Brothers have done throughout the years, but and also working with Van Halen come time to do the 1984 record, which was a, a massive record for Van Halen. Michael McDonald actually co-wrote the song I'll Wait off of that 1984 record? That's correct. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it went uncredited at first, and that caused a little bit of a of a commotion. But they sorted it out, and and yeah, now when you when you you know are scanning the credits, you know you'll see that that co write. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, totally. And I mean, I'm assuming that was a Ted Templeman connection uh, in working with Van Halen, and then with his past history of working with the Doobie Brothers. Like, yeah, I know a guy. That's just such a bizarre connection. Uh, I, you know, it's super cool. It is, but you're but you're absolutely right. That is the connection. And Ted just put a, a book out, an autobiography out recently. That's a pretty good read uh, for people that are into that kind of stuff. And he he tells the story about that. He said that you know Van Halen had little bits of all weight that. And Ted thought it was good and could be a hit, but they were having trouble with one of the sections. I don't know if it was the bridge or something. Uh huh. So he he hooked Michael and David up together, and they kind of finished it. So yeah, that is so wild, unbelievable, man. Have you heard any stories uh, from the Doobie guys uh, about working with him? Because I mean, t t if I understand it correct, Ted Templeman was worked has he worked on all of the Doobie Brothers records, pretty much. I think T Teddy produced all of the records in the 70s with the exception of the first one. Okay. The very first one. And then he produced a record they put out in, shoot, I think maybe it was 2010. The Doobies put out a record called World Gone Crazy. Uh huh. And Ted pr produced some of that record. Wow. Um, but yeah, he did all those 70s records. I mean, you know, back then when you sort of, you know, people found a team. And, the, you know, they kind of harnessed their sound and they kind of stuck with, you know, 
the, the people that, that did it. So the engineer on, on all those records, a guy named Don Landy, uh-huh. he's on, he engineers all that stuff. And, wow. and Don and Teddy really worked as a team. Mm. So when you see a lot of the records that they produced together, you know, Little Feet, Van Halen, uh, Nicolette Larson, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, it's, it's Teddy and, and Don together and Van Halen, you know, super cool history there. Um, with, uh, you mentioned vertical horizon, obviously, uh, uh, it's it, the late nineties, like early two thousands were kind of a strange time for me personally. I had kind of checked out of, of sort of rock radio, uh, come the late nineties. So I kind of missed a lot of the time. And that's kind of the time that I feel like vertical horizon was having its hits alongside some of the other bands that were on the radio at the time. And it's also a weird time because I think Napster was kind of rolling around. I feel like the the you know within a few years the record industry was even more in flux than ever, and it kind of seemed as though, from my perspective, that with it becoming more in flux uh, and the business maybe being more threatened, to, according to them, uh, by by streaming or Napster or whatever it was, it seemed like the templates for what bands could be on the radio became sort of more confined. And so at that time, I kind of just checked out, but I had to go back and, and be reminded of the songs that Vertical Horizon did. And, and I was like, oh, well, I, of course, heard these songs. I didn't even quite make the connection because, again, I was kind of just off in my own world, having sort of been around for the early 90s and dug that first wave of grunge and everything. But I guess tell me a little bit about your time with, with uh, Vertical Horizon and sort of how, uh, you know, what that trajectory was because... As far as I know, I mean, on your first record, you had two pretty big hits, obviously. So was it just like you started the band and before you know it, you got a record deal? And then, I mean, what was the what was the process or the trajectory? <laughs> Not at all. So I joined Vertical Horizon in 1996, and they had already been together for about four years at that point. It started as a guitar duo. Gotcha. Um, so it was, just, it was just Matt and Keith doing the sort of acoustic duo kind of thing. And they had done a little bit of regional touring and had, had built up a bit of a following. And then they they made, you know, they had made a record with just the two of them. And then they made a second record where they added a rhythm section to it. And uh, one of the guys that was playing drums on the majority of it just happened to be Carter Beaufort from Dave Matthews Band. Oh, wow. So they had this record out, which is a record called Running on Ice. Uh-huh. Um, and then they they said, well, you know, we should probably go out with a rhythm section. We've got this, you know, record that's got bass and and drums on it now. We should probably have bass and drums in the band. So they added a bass player and a drummer. And I guess shortly into this, the drummer didn't love being on the road because this is back in the days of, like, staying in campgrounds and sleeping on people's floors and, and that kind of stuff. You know, you're just sort of touring around playing music for the love of it. You're making a little bit of money, but not... You know, I, I quit a job at Borders Books and Music to, to join Vertical Horizon and <laughs> was making less money with them than I had been making at retail at like minimum wage. Oh, my know? God. Yeah. But dude, it didn't matter. I was traveling <laughs> around the country and playing music for a living to, to handfuls of people that wanted to hear it. Right. So I joined in 96. And uh, by the time 1998 rolled around, we had... You know, we had done a lot of touring and we had built up a pretty good fan base and we had made a live record at that point that we put out ourselves. And at this point, between the three indie records that the band had made, we had sold a good, like, you know, 80,000 records or so. Wow. And uh, the labels started calling. We were also part of a scene. I don't even know if a scene like this kind of exists anymore, but. In the 90s, there was this great sort of college, like, roots rock scene uh-huh. that all these bands came out of. Uh, you know, Hootie the Blowfish, Matchbox 20, Dave Matthews Band. Right. Um, I, I could go on and on. Sure. All came out of these, of, you know, that we would just tour around the country, play college towns, and it was kind of brilliant. You'd build up a following. Like, for example, we had a big following around Wake Forest in, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, yeah. for some reason. People there loved vertical horizon well you know and the other thing is we let people record the shows Mm. and the great thing about that is that you know these college kids would would go home for a christmas break or spring break or whatever and they'd tell five of their friends like hey you have to check out this band and then you know maybe one of those people tells a few of their friends like because you're always turning friends on to new music at least 
used to. Yeah. So that's kind of how that all built up. And once a couple of those bands from that scene got signed and made records that were that did very well, the labels really started paying attention to what was going on on that scene. And then a whole bunch of us signed label deals. Right. Um, and some of us were able to break through the cracks with a hit, and unfortunately, some of us weren't. But it was really a, a crazy time. And I think vertical success, I think, was really at the tail end of what was a sort of cool period, that 90s period, where you could still hear all kinds of different stuff on the radio. Uh -huh. And really, it has nothing to do with music and everything to do with, like, you know, once like deregulated radio and radio stations, you know, companies were able to come in and start purchasing a bunch of radio stations. And that's when you had the consolidation and then playlists mm. became, you know, programmed and, you know, we're going to play these songs on, on, on the 100 radio stations that this company owns and all that. And it just became like, it, it really killed radio in my opinion huh interesting so and then and then of course streaming came along after that so right. I, I, I gotta be honest with you I, i'm surprised that radio is still a thing totally <laughs> yeah. totally yeah absolutely uh well prior to all this man i didn't even really ask you how you stumbled upon the drums anyway uh and w where did you grow up again oh, oh right in connecticut right yeah i grew up in the state of connecticut and like i said my dad is a guitar player um he was a guitar player professionally when i was born um, he held down this jazz gig for seven years in southeastern Connecticut. Wow. And um, so there was just music in the house all the time. And like I said, all kinds of music, all the bands I mentioned earlier. Plus, my dad was a jazz nut, so there was always some West Montgomery, some Jimmy Smith going on in right. the house sure. constantly. How, he was a big fan of a guy called Howard Roberts, so mm -hmm. those records were, were always playing. And so it was just – there was music around all the time, and I just loved it and gravitated towards it. Yeah. And. I don't really, I'm not really sure why the drums, there was no sort of lightning bolt moment. It just always seemed to be there. Uh -huh. um, you know, I used to bang around on things with, with mom's wooden spoons. And so eventually they got me a pair of sticks and a drum pad and, and it just evolved from there as it does, you know? Totally. But yeah, I don't, I don't really, I don't really have a, okay, this was the moment. It just, it really just always seemed to be there for me. Uh-huh. Did you play in like school band or 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 do any stuff like that? I did, yeah. Well, in Connecticut, you know, we were fortunate enough at the time. This would have been in the seventies. Um, you know, you could start learning and playing an instrument in I think fourth grade. So right. I had I had already taken some drum lessons when I was six years old. You know, my dad had saw that I had a I had a knack for it, and so he enrolled me in some lessons at a local music store. Um, so I, I began to learn to read music and, and that kind of stuff. So by the time I got to fourth grade and, you know, was playing in a band situation, it was the first sort of orchestral band I ever played in. Ah. And then I just got deep into it. I mean, I got deep into the marching thing when I was in high school, and I marched a year at Drum Corps mm -hmm. uh, with a corps out of New Jersey, and I marched when I was in college. Nice. So, yeah, I was just deep in it at that point. Awesome, man. Well, having gone through drum corps, and I, I've had some friends that came from that world. I too was in marching band, uh, and you know, there's always an emphasis on rudiments and going through all that. Do you find that you still stick with that stuff and sort of run through the rudiments, uh, or, or not even so much? No, I still run through stuff from time to time. You know, my practice regimen is not nearly what it used to be. I don't really practice that often. Yeah, I wish I practiced more, but you know, like you, you grow up, you have kids, like things change. But, um, I, you know, when I warm up before every show, when I'm on the road, I'm generally doing uh, marching exercises. Totally. So yeah. that, that stuff still sticks, still sticks with me. Or I'm playing parts that I played when I was a teenager, you right. know, because it, it helps warm the hands up and, and get the blood flowing and all that. Absolutely. Yeah, man. I mean, for me, 25 years after me doing some of that marching band stuff and hanging around some drum corps guys, I too still use some of those warm ups just to run through rudiments and different pairings and everything. That is that is pretty much my warm up uh, b prior to a show. So I hear you. It's funny that it would stick around after all these years, right? Yeah. <laughs> nice, man. Well, uh, other than, uh, you know, these upcoming shows, of which it sounds like there's definitely a good stretch of them, uh, do you have anything else going on, or is it just prepping for uh, for this big run of shows? Yeah, really everything right now is concentrated on this tour um, and just really learning the material and, just, you know, just trying to play minute-by-minute minute 
good because it's so hard to play, you know. Right. So yeah, I'm 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 focused on that stuff right now. I'm doing a gig with um, our bass player John Cowan. Uh, we're doing a, a bluegrass festival called Merle Fest uh, coming up. That's in September, middle of September, uh, during a break from this tour. Mm. Um, and other than that, it, there's not too much happening. You know, I'm just starting to get to know some people in the in in music in the area that I'm living now in Pennsylvania. Right. And uh, so hopefully some things can come out of that. But uh, yeah, right now all my focus is is on the Doobies tour. I hear you, man. Well, that's exciting. And uh, I'm glad y'all are coming through uh, Salt Lake City. We actually moved out here uh, back in November from New York. I'd been out there for 15 years, so uh, hopefully I can catch up with y'all. It'd be great to see it. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a fan of, of the many eras uh, of the Doobie Brothers and such a, a super cool collection of songs. So the idea of revisiting them throughout the years and different records and everything, like you said, it's uh, definitely diverse for, for me as an audience member and for you, as you said, there's a joy in being able to have some diversity in the set to be able to play all that o over the years. So I look forward to, to seeing it. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Well, uh, right on, Ed. It was great catching up with you, man. I appreciate the time, and uh, we'll have to catch up soon. Sounds great. All right, everybody, thanks for catching this episode. Thanks to Ed for rapping with me. Always fun to talk shop with some fellow 70s rockers, and it certainly didn't hurt to hear some of the killer shows that he caught in the 70s and 80s. Steve Perry in the 80s. I would have liked to have seen it, as well as Stuart Copeland. Not going to lie. We'll catch you on the flippy floppy. Crash, bang, boom. Boom. <laughs>